Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. Today we have with us John Schramm, who's the founder of The Purple Guys. John, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So I want to hear your background and what led you to the world of IT. Um, and I hope that uh, part of your introduction is the, the story behind why choosing a company called Purple Guys. Why, why name it that other than just something <laughs> that sticks out in your mind, which success and job well done. <laughs> Well, I appreciate it. Uh, and the background of what drew me to entrepreneurialism in general, uh, kind of always wanted to start my own thing. And fast forward to today, I am, I, w- I describe myself as an unintentional serial entrepreneur. So there was actually two startups prior to what is now Purple Guys. Uh, and that's a longer story, probably for an entire another podcast about how to not pick partners. Yeah. Uh, cause I had two very successful business startups and successful business and two very unsuccessful partnerships, um, which led me to round three and what is now the purple guys. But, uh, in 2001, uh, so in September of 2001, decided to leave my last endeavor. Uh, and timing being everything, made the announcement to my fellow owners on September 10th, uh, 2001, that uh, oh, I was leaving. Yeah. And uh, next that's day, a, that's an in- interesting so date. The next day, it is very much an inter- interesting date. And I will tell you the anxiety and stress yeah. around money and money and stuff uh, was immediately put into perspective. Um, and while it was a lot of money and stuff, it was just money and stuff. And I was not on, yeah. not on a plane. I was in New York. Uh, so it really helped to keep things in perspective. Uh, I would say I would not pick, uh, starting a brand new business, uh, on the heels of nine 11, but it is what it is and was what it yeah. was back then. Uh, but we launched, uh, we did not launch. So getting to the, the name of purple guys, we did not launch as the purple guys I actually had hired an ad agency, came up with a name, had a logo. Uh, the only good marketing idea I ever had personally was the company I had before this. We had a purple logo. We had purple pens that we would hand out. That was my idea. We, we would hand out a purple pen and wrote in purple ink. So when I started this business, I knew I wanted to keep a purple logo. That was all I really huh. knew, and I wanted to keep my purple pens. So we did launch this business in October of 2001. Uh, and you know, we do IT support. We show up on site. Uh, at least we did 20 years ago when we started it. Um, and the origin of the purple guys, uh, we were, we had branded apparel, uh, with the company name on it for about the first year and a half and then just decided, all right, we, we need a team uniform. So I took all the branded apparel back, got everybody new branded apparel, but in the company color, which was purple, uh, we started showing up on site in purple shirts and our customers independent of each other, uh, within that first week started saying, Hey, the purple guys are here. Uh, <laughs> slow, but I am not that slow. I'm like, all right, you can't remember the old name. You can't spell it. You can't pronounce it. Uh, we're yep. going to be the purple guys. So really from about wow. two and a half years in, um, so roughly 2018, our customers named us. So I guess I was paying attention enough to uh, listen to what our customers were talking about. And they decided to call us the purple guys. I liked it. Uh, and ran with it. And it has been a fabulous brand ever since. Well, interesting. Um, I mean, you, one takeaway with that, and we could just really dive in deep on branding and positioning and, and all of that. But one thing that strikes me is this. Um, way back in the day, whatever date I'm thinking of, which I'm not exactly sure, but you'll know where I'm going when I say this. Mm-hmm. Who the heck knew what an Amazon was? Right. Oh, yeah. Before Jeff Bezos <laughs> came and said, what, what was that? The, the company with the arrow under. So now we know Amazon is Amazon. Well, your target audience knew you as what you provided to them because you were visible in the marketplace. You were personally there. They saw you. Hence, they yep. saw the purple. And so 
there you go. So you created your um, persona and listened to your target audience and your tribe, as Seth Godin would say, and you went with that. Now, if you tried to launch, you know, back then, some website uh, services company that said Purple Guys, there might have been a disconnect until you just educated the daylights out of your audience, but that would have been really broad. But now you had that really kind of shoot frisk in a barrel concept because you were just talking to and listening to the people you were seeing on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. Absolutely. Uh, and I will tell you the, the branding with a color or really even just a team uniform, it makes you recognizable. Yeah. Um, and what I, I didn't realize when we first started out, I'm like, oh, yeah, we got a brand. We've got something that our customers are calling us. We would show up at small business events like the, the, the Kansas City Chamber here in town, and there'd be 150 other companies in the room at an event. And I got credit for anybody that happened to be wearing purple. They just assumed uh, they were part of my company. Uh, so way back when, you guys are all uh, over the place. We had the, appearance, <laughs> we had the appearance of a much larger company. Yeah. You know, it, it it was just you know added benefit to using the color as the brand. Um, and I think you hit on it earlier. It's you know small business and just business in general getting to the decision maker and staying top of mind is just really hard i mean yeah. whatever service or product you're selling so if i can in a you know 30 second conversation get people to associate the color purple with computers and computer support then the next time they're frustrated they'll remember the color and if you google purple computer support we're the only thing that comes up so it is again an accidental brand but it's been awesome from a name recognition uh, perspective. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about some of your successes and failures growing the company because I can only assume that back then, today, it doesn't matter that IT services, um, you've got a competitor or thousand. So, you know, what are are some of the things you dealt with? Uh, Well, like any business, growing pains is always one of those things you deal with. So it's that chicken or the egg. Do you hire the more people so you can support more people? And that balancing act of having to actually maintain cash flow. Uh, And I will tell you that in 2006, it was 2006 to 2007, we switched our business model up to 2006. So about the first five years of our history, we were prepaid services, but work an hour, bill an hour. So it was pretty much an hourly model getting prepaid. So the cash flow was good, but it was all tied to the amount of hours it took to support a customer. Trading um, hours for dollars. We were just trading hours for dollars. Um, And I will tell you that it's the same today as it was back then. Our customers have literally no idea how long something should take, nor should they. Um, Yeah. Uh, so you know, should it take an hour to refresh a PC or should it take two days? They, they really have no idea. Um, and in 2006, I decided to break that model uh, and went to a fixed fee support model where we would say, all right, for X dollars a month, everything's included. So you're no longer going to have to pay by the hour. Um, it was a great concept uh, and it has worked out really, really well. But I will tell you, I priced it wrong <laughs> right off the bat. Uh, and I watched my profits nosedive. Uh, so we adjusted quick enough to stay in business. The other thing that changed, as anybody that has employees knows, if you mess with somebody's compensation, they might leave. Yeah. Um, and I had a compensation model that was tied to billable hours prior to that point because it totally lined my employees up with the company goals, with what we were doing and how we were billing. When we broke that model and were no longer tied to billable hours, I had to change compensation. So I changed the compensation plans, added bonuses in place to kind of balance things out. But I turned over almost 100% of my staff in a 12-month period because they were annoyed that they no longer had as clean of a line of sight to their compensation as they had before. Mm. And I did not anticipate that, but lesson learned for me, uh, you really have to pay attention to when you're going to make a change to someone's compensation, being as transparent and over-communicate the heck out of it. Um, in my head, what I was trying to do was actually pay them more because I was expecting the company to become more efficient. Uh, what they perceived was I was somehow cutting their pay. Uh, mm-hmm. So lack of lack of insight on my part, uh, but I, I it was a hard lesson to learn because we we had a had a rough go of it as we as we transitioned. Yeah, um, very great point, and we'll put a pin in that to say. 
um, many times those are overcome by expressing the intent behind it. And when people understand the intent, then it's like, oh, okay, good. I see where you're going with that. Didn't quite work out. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see your fix is X, Y, Z, P, D, K. Okay, good. Yep. And let's move forward. And then you kind of step back and go, okay, lesson learned. Now when I need to make some type of a change, I'm going to almost kind of like I've heard it said before, I'm going to start an internal promotion campaign to my own people to start talking about yep. the need for whatever and start just kind of hinting at it and say, you know, would it be great if, and hey, I've been doing some research and then here's this announcement. Let's be clear. It is going to do X, Y, Z. So there's always those lessons that we need to learn to improve, change, do more of, not do more. So I think that's a really big aha there is don't feel bad when a hiccup happens like, ooh, I went to this model and our profits tanked. Okay, well, I noticed it eat quick enough to right the ship. And there's a lot of people that yeah. don't realize it until it's way too late. Yeah. Yeah. So have, having the dashboard that I had on my cash yeah. flow and profitability and the insight into it helped me correct things fast enough that we didn't go completely off the cliff. We got, we got really close to the cliff, yep. <laughs> but we did not go over. So it, uh, uh, it, it was good to be able to adapt, and it has been fantastic since yeah. then because once we got the business model lined up, we are very much now on the same page with our customers. It's you know Our goal is to keep things running as smoothly as possible. They don't want to have to call us. We don't bill by the hour, so the fewer calls they have to make, the happier we are and the happier yeah. they are. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been a fantastic model since we shifted. And and so now I think I'm correct in seeing that you do um, a lot of your work remotely, not only with clients, but also with your employees. So you have a remote team environment. Is that correct? Yeah. When when 20, ha 20 happened, just like everybody else, uh, we went remote for a while uh, and discovered that we don't really all have to be in the same room. Uh, yeah. We have leveraged the heck out of the Microsoft Teams world with its chat and phone and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and prior to that, we really had the model of essentially the call center that was here inside of our four walls. We had a team that essentially stayed here to answer those calls and collaborated with one another inside of, of the building here. And then we had a team that was out and about. And now we've got a team that's really more spread out geographically. Um, and, and really, we can recruit from anywhere now um, and plug them into our model because we have proven, as has most of the planet, that you can work remotely and still be effective. There are times when you do need some face time, uh, but we have shifted. So we, we've got a hybrid model right now where some people are in the office, some people are not, uh, and we expect that to continue pretty much forever. Uh, yeah. We're going to have that flexibility to be in or out of the office. So it's, it's been uh, a, a huge plus. Yeah, and I, I think that a lot of industries have discovered the same thing where, you know, like, for instance, I've got some clients that are in legal services and, you know, you, you need to go meet with your attorney, but during COVID, we need to go remote. Well, in reality, there's a lot of people that, do I really need to get in my car, drive downtown, pay for parking, find the building, sit down, have an hour meeting and leave, or jump on Zoom and it's live. It's the same difference as sitting in the same room. So I do know that there's employers that feel like I would never go fully remote uh, um, all the time. Let, maybe let's make a, let's take a lesson learned from COVID and go, let, we're going to create a work from home policy that looks like this. So, so we've attained yeah. some flexibility. So um, I think I heard rumor that it might have been Yahoo or one of the big, big uh, companies that said, we're never going back to in, in person. We're, we're going remote. It's saving us so much money. We're way more efficient. And, you know, you can find some expert that uh, says, look, here's this study that shows you're way more efficient. And then some other expert that can say, yeah, but. So, I mean, it really does get down mm -hmm. to what is right for your organization. I totally agree. And one of the things we have discovered, because we're still on very much a growth mode, is that when you onboard a new employee, it looks different when most of your team is remote versus when they yeah. were mostly in the office. You could have a team lunch and they put a name with a face yeah. very quickly. Uh, and, you know, the chit chat that just kind of happens as you're eating and, and sitting there, that some of that chit chat, well, actually not some of it, most of that chit chat does not occur online. Yeah. Um, so you miss that as part of building that culture for the new folks that are coming in, which is why, you know, we, sh we still try to create times for everybody to get together. Um, and it's, it has helped. 
but we're, we're still figuring that out and kind of what that hybrid model looks like. But yeah, I fully expect it to be hybrid forever. Yeah. And whether it's 70, 30, 60, what, it doesn't matter, hybrid, yeah. and we'll just see where it goes. Hey, so let's wrap yeah. up with this. I know that a lot of people might think, you know, well, I'm kind of uh, – it's kind of like the concept of um, when should you hire a virtual assistant or when should you hire that first salesperson? Because, you know, as the CEO, well, I could still do that. I could do that. Well, at some yeah. point, the highest and best use of your time is not to do that. So when's the right time for a business to look at and hire an IT company? I would say for most businesses, the day that they re- realize that technology is critical to their business. Um, and what I mean by that is it could be, you know, day one or two of operations, or it could be, you know, two or three years down the road. But when you have enough riding on the technology working and keeping your data and your business safe is when you should look to some form of expertise um, outside of your four walls, unless you're a technology person at heart, at which point you just need to figure out when you're going to take that hat off and, and hand yeah. it on as the business owner. Um, but the the critical piece is how do you buy it? And again, if you're a two person shop versus a twenty person company, it, it it's a different model. Um, a two person shop can probably get by with just paying by the hour, finding somebody that's a good resource, versus the twenty person shop is going to have a more predictable need ongoing day over day over day. Um, so the how you buy it is kind of more the conversation versus when is the time. Um, cause at least in my opinion, um, technology is vital to pretty much every single industry at this point. Uh, and where, you know, probably four years ago, maybe five years ago, a small business was a needle in a haystack in terms of being a target for the bad actors that are out there in the internet world. Um, today there are so many bad actors that you have to be concerned about security and it's just just a function of doing business and being plugged into the web. Um, you don't have to be a technical person anymore to be a bad guy in the internet world. You can buy the stuff. It's essentially shrink wrap software almost off the shelf. They, they even have a help desk for it. Um, so the number of people that are out looking for ways to exploit and, um, and essentially ransom small businesses and their tech and their uh, data has grown exponentially. So you've got to have that focus on how do I keep my stuff secure? Is it backed up? Is it staying updated? And then the general run of you know day to day stuff of who do they call when something on the technical you know, technical side doesn't work? From as simple as I can't print or I forgot my password, into as complex as you know my my machine's actually locked up and I can't get anything done. Yeah. So. And and I'm sure you you would be like a uh, uh, you would make a comment similar to like a physician where it's like let's do some preventative maintenance before things break down yeah. where we have to really fix Correct. it and now you're down and so preventative is an yeah. important piece. Correct. Yeah. The the proactive preventative stuff and you know one of the analogies I like to use is car. You can you can not buy the warranty and you can not do the regular maintenance on your car and just drive it until the timing belt blows up. Uh, and you've got a big giant bill, and a lot of people I've seen they'll they'll run their technology that way. They're like, all right, it's, it's working well enough, nothing's horribly broken. I'm just going to keep driving down the road, and then all of a sudden they get hit with either a virus, or ransomware, or something just majorly collapses. In which case they're out of business for some period of time while they're recovering, and they have to write a big giant check to get everything back up and running, and hopefully they survive that. Um, versus paying to do the regular maintenance and keep it up and running. 100%. Well, it was really great uh, chatting with you, John. I really appreciate you coming on. What's the best way that people can reach out and connect with you guys? Uh, Best way is find us on the web. It's just purpleguys.com. So just the color purple, G-U-I-S.com. And all of our contact info is out there. We've also got a great presence on LinkedIn. So probably those two places. You can find us both under Purple Guys. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for coming on today. I appreciate your time. Appreciate it. It's been great. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.